let's get started. All right, let's get, let's get into prayer. So, Heavenly Father, glory be to your name. Holy Spirit, help me to pray so I pray a better and more effective prayer, Lord. Just thank you for this time that we have here together in this Bible class, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you speak through me and help me to preach and teach the lesson that you have for your kiddos today, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that this touches that this lesson touches their hearts and teaches them a lot of things that they may not have known before. I pray, Lord, that your people are built up and edified by this message and that they can come come out of this with new wisdom, new knowledge, understanding and discernment of you and your word. Lord, in Jesus name we pray. Hallelujah. Thank God. Amen. Whew. Let's go. I'm excited. Oh, and I pray, Lord, take away my anxiety and nervousness and anything of that nature. In Jesus name. Thank God. Amen. Let's go. All right. So today, guys, we're going to continue our series on the reality of sin. I don't know if this is going to be the last message in the series. It might be. I'm not too sure. I might have something else to store for you, but right now it's looking like the last message. So, yeah, but today I wanted to talk about something that I kind of glossed over a little bit when I talked to you guys last time. And that's talking about how sin affects our relationship with God. And it's, it's very good for you guys to realize how sin affects your relationship with God. So that for one, like the, the entire purpose of this series really is just to get you to, to stop sinning. But also, if you just know how badly sin affects your relationship with God, that really just will make you think in hindsight, just like, should I really be doing this right now? Because look what this might do to my relationship with God, you know? So we're going to talk about that today. We're going to go into more detail with that today. And we're going to learn just a few other things that are super awesome to know as Christians as well. And really, to start off this message, I really wanted to talk to you about how sin affects us not only as Christians, but how sin also affects non-believers. And that's purely because when we sin, sin separates us from god right so when whenever you sin you have been separated from god or at least it was that way underneath the law of moses or just known as the law in general hold on let me move my camera ever so slightly there we go all right so at least it was like that way underneath the law because the wages of sin is death. And as it says in Hebrews chapter nine, verse 22, it says, and almost all things are cleansed with blood according to the law. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So underneath the law, underneath the law of Moses, like people had to sacrifice animals, right? And the reason why they had to sacrifice animals is because sin separated us from God. And the only way to get back to God, the only way to receive forgiveness of sins and also to appease the wrath of God, which is called propitiation, you had to shed some blood. So rather than the human dying, animals died. And so with that shedding of blood, God's wrath was appeased and people were able to be forgiven of their sin, which absolutely sucked because <laughs> uh, imagine like, Imagine like you go lie or you lust after somebody or something like that. You got like, dang, man, now I got to go sacrifice an animal. Because the thing is about the law of Moses is that not only were they sacrificing animals, but they were sacrificing the cream of the crop. Like the Lord was just like the animal can't have no type of blemish. It can only be very specific animals like lambs and rams and a few other other things. It had to be like the firstborn son and all types of stuff like that. He had to sacrifice uh, those animals in order to appease the wrath of God. And so that you were able, so that you would be able to receive forgiveness for God. And the reason for, for that is because the wages of sin is death. The Lord, our God is a just and a holy God. He can, he cannot and does not tolerate sin because sin is the antithesis of God. If you don't know what antithesis means, all it simply means is that it's the opposite or the direct opposite of something. So sin is the direct opposite of God. And as a just and a holy God, he cannot stand sin, nor, to, nor can he be near sin. So before we have the covenant of grace underneath the law of Moses, when we sinned, you know, before we, sin, before we sin, you know, we're righteous and we're blameless before God. But then after we sin, we are separated from God. And the only way to get back to that place with God was for an animal sacrifice that had been made to appease the wrath of God because the wages of sin is death. So God is a just and holy God. And because we sin, there has to be justice for that. There, there's a wrath to that. So first his wrath had to be appeased. And so after the blood, after the, uh, after blood was shed, then we could go and ask God for forgiveness of our sins. He forgive us. And so then now we're back with God again. We should be very glad that we don't have to do that anymore because also a big thing with the law, if you did not know this, is that if you break one of the laws, you break all 613 of them. So now not only did you sin once, but then you sin 613 times. But now because of Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross, we don't have to do that anymore. 
And it's such, such a beautiful thing for those that have faith unto Jesus Christ. Now, whenever we sin, we're not separated from God. And that's because Jesus paid the ultimate sacrifice on the cross. And he, and also all the wrath of God that would come from us sinning came upon him. Right. Because a perfect man who lived the sinless life died on the cross for the sins of not only just a few people, but the entirety of the world. So that now those that have faith unto Jesus Christ being us Christians. Now, whenever we sin, we're not we're no longer separated from God, but we're still close to him. And I'll tell you why the why that is in a second. And now we can approach the throne of grace, as it says in Hebrews 4, 16, it says, therefore, let's approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace for help at the time of our need. And the reason why that's the case is because Jesus is perfect righteousness that he earned because he lived this entire human life without sinning at all. Because he was literally perfect since the day he was born. His righteousness is imputed unto us. If you don't know what imputation is or um, his righteousness being imputed unto us means, that means that simply his righteousness was given to us. So now Christ's righteousness was given to us and our sin was taken onto the cross. And the wrath of God was appeased on the cross by Christ, which is an amazing thing. That's why Jesus Christ had to die on the cross. Because by the way that we were going, life was going to be way too hard for us and God because God requires us to be perfect. But every single time we sinned, we were separated from God. So we're close again. They were separated. You know, we're righteous. They were unrighteous, righteous, unrighteous. But then now with Jesus, now that we have faith unto him, we have received his righteousness. Now we're righteous. And if we sin, we're still righteous. But now we can just approach the throne of God and say, Lord, hey, sorry, I need forgiveness. He says, OK, son or daughter, I forgive you, son or daughter of God. God, don't worry about it. Jesus already paid the price on the cross because Jesus also on the cross paid the wages of sin, which is death. His death paid that wage for sin. And so the wrath of God is also appeased there. And so that's one thing I just want to tell you guys about sin before we get into a little bit of the other things, because this not only affects us as Christians, but it affects non-believers as well. Because they're in a state where because of their sin, they are separate from God. And so the wrath of God is going to come upon them until they have faith unto Jesus Christ. And so then when they do have faith unto Jesus Christ and decide to live their life for him, that's when the wrath of God will be appeased. The ways of sin sin has been paid and they will be able to approach the throne of grace as well and receive grace just as we do grace and mercy just as we do but there's some there's something that i typically tell you guys all the time in regards to how sin affects our relationship with god because i always tell you guys like oh i was addicted to pornography for eight years and so the lord had said to me at one point son if you continue to watch pornography then me and you cannot get deeper in our relationship and I wanted to take some time to explain to you guys exactly why that is the case. So why does sin stagnate our relationship with God? How does sin, sin stagnate our relationship with God? And I want to read to you a little bit of scripture to explain that to you and to really explain why I keep telling you that when you habitually sin. So when you make a practice of sinning, you can consistently and constantly sin, whether you're watching pornography every day or masturbating every day, or you have an incredibly bad problem with lust or you're a um habitual liar or you're incredibly powerful all these things how does it stagnate your relationship with god now i, I want to read these verses to you to help illustrate the answer to this question and it's first john chapter one verses six through seven it says if we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness we lie and do not practice the truth but we, if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light we have fellowship with one another and the blood of jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. And so the big part here that I want you guys to grab is 1 John 1, 6. It says, if we say that we have fellowship with him being God and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. And why is that the case? Why is it that if we say that we have fellowship with God and we walk in darkness that we lie and do not practice the truth? The truth. Why is that the case? Why does John call us a liar and non-practicers of the truth if we have fellowship with darkness? Or if we walk in darkness, if you don't know what darkness is, where John's talking about here is that darkness is sin. Well, I want to read to you 2 Corinthians 6, 14. It says, do not be mismatched with unbelievers for what do righteousness and lawlessness share together? Or what does light have in common with darkness? And you might be wondering, what is light? 
Well, light is God. Actually, if you read first John chapter one, literally like the subheading in there is literally God is light. Right. And actually it says that in one of the verses, but light is God and sin is darkness. And as it says in second Corinthians six fourteen, it says, what does light have in common with darkness? The reason why sin stagnates our relationship with God or actually better yet, sin prevents us from getting deeper into our relationships with God. And I'm talking about habitual sin. As Christians, we are literally expected to sin because we're not perfect. We are human beings. We slip up and mess up. But his habitual sin is something that God doesn't want us to do. And so and so the reason why habitual sin stagnates and prevents us from getting deeper in our relationship with God is purely because light cannot light does not have fellowship with darkness because the lord our god is a just and a holy god as i was saying and sin being the antithesis or the opposite of him he cannot have fellowship with it it's not something that he can mix and mingle with it's not light cannot mix and mingle with darkness either it's one or the other you either got light or you either got darkness and as it says in first john 6 6 it says if we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness we lie and do not practice the truth because the truth that is light cannot mingle with the lies that are darkness, right? So simply put, the reason why your relationship with God will stagnate because you habitually sin or the reason why you can't get deeper with God because of habitual sin is purely because God cannot mingle with your darkness. The God who is the light cannot mingle with your sin. And so if you find yourself consistently watching pornography every day, uh, walking in masturbation every day, smoking every day, day, you might be drinking until drunkenness all the time. You might be fornicating all the time. You might be an adulterer and all these things. If you find yourself doing these things and going to God saying, OK, let's go deeper. He's going to say, hold on. Wait, 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 wait. I can't do that with you, big dog. I can't go deeper with you because I can't mingle with the sin that you're entertaining that habitual sin that you're entertaining. So before that, before we are able to move together, before we are able to have that true and genuine fellowship that I want to have with you, we got to get rid of that first. And to give you a bit of a visual example, think of like, dang, I wish I had something in my hand, but, but think of like, think of like two people, right? And so one is full of light or white. And the other one is also full of light, but there's like a circle within you know, the part where they are, where their heart is, that's black. And so these two people want to merge together. Obviously, the one that's full of light is going to be Jesus Christ, God, Holy Spirit, whichever one that you that you want to say. And the person that has all the light but has that darkness in the middle, let's say that's you. And that, and that darkness in the middle is your habitual sin. When the person that's all light and the person with a little bit of darkness try to merge, they won't be able to merge completely until the darkness is gone. Until then, they're just going to have a little dark spot there. And so they're not going to be able to merge completely. I feel like that was a bad example. Yeah, honestly, that is a bad example. Y'all don't need no type of example. But anyway, the, the pure point is, is that when you walk in habitual sin and try to get deeper with God, he's going to say to you that we cannot go further until you get rid of this. And the reason is because He's a just and holy God, and he calls us to be holy as he is holy. And it's his will that is our sanctification, that he makes us holy as he is holy. And when we walk in habitual sin, it prevents him from making us holy as he is holy. And so until that is erased, we will not be able to go deeper with him which is why it's very dangerous for us as Christians to walk in habitual sin and why it's expected of us as Christians to eventually get rid of habitual sin. We got to work with God and leave habitual sin at the door because every last one of us should have something that we do regularly or had something that we do regularly that we have a hard time with, whether it's in music counts too, listen to worldly music counts too, right? Whether it's worldly music, whether it's masturbation, whether it's fornication, whether it's drinking until drunkenness, whether it's smoking or whether it's all these different things that we struggle with. And eventually we're going to have to let that go. Because if we want to get deeper with God, we want to pursue the greater things of God, get to the levels that David and Moses and all these great people did. We have to let these things go because, again, light simply cannot have any type of fellowship with darkness. But other than that, like other other than the pure fact that like literally habitual sin stagnates our relationship with God, what are some other things or other ways that sin also affects our relationship with God? I want to give you three other things that sin does to you 
and your relationship with God. And the first one is that simply put is that it's literally expected of you by God, like I was saying, to stop habitually sinning. And I want to read some scripture to you. It says in 1 John chapter 3, verses 6 to 7, it says, no one who remains in him sins continually. No one who sins continually has seen him or know, knows him. Little children, make sure not to uh, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. As it says in the word of God from John, first chapter, John chapter three, no one who remains in God will sin continually. As in no one who remains in God will practice sinning or sin habitually. Again, I want to tell you this is that as Christians, you will sin. You're going to you're going to fail. OK, <laughs> sometimes you're going to slip up. Sometimes you're going to say that little curse word or you might even lie to somebody or you might be prideful. You might walk in a little bit of unforgiveness. But it's not something that should be habitual, nor is it something that you should be making a practice of. And so it's literally expected of us as Christians to get rid of that habitual sin. And because it's expected of us, when you don't do it, it begins to affect you and God because it's something that he expects of you. Because God expects different things of different people. But when it comes to this, he expects us out of every last one of his children. Now, another thing that sin does in regards to affecting our relationship with God is that it literally affects our ability to serve God. And I want to read some more scripture to you. Galatians 5 verses 16 and 17. It says, but I say, or, but I say, walk by the spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh for the desire of the flesh is against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another in order to keep you from doing whatever you want. As anybody will know, I'm not even going to say that. All of you should have heard the saying at one point or another. If you haven't heard it, you finna hear it today. You are what you eat. And so uh, I, actually some of y'all have never been here before. So I'm going to really illustrate to you this example. But when you're going throughout life, there's two things that you can eat. There's two things that you can eat and they feed two different things, right? One feeds the flesh and the other one feeds the spirit. Whenever you interact and deal with the things of God, prayer, reading your Bible, worshiping, all those things, it feeds your spirit, right? So whenever you do things of God, it ends up feeding your spirit. But whenever you sin, you gratify the desires of the flesh and so many different things, walk, walk in lust and jealousies and envies and anger and so many different things. What it ends up doing is that it ends up feeding your flesh. And so the more of which one, whichever one of these things that you feed, so let's say that your flesh is built. You've been feeding your flesh every single day. Your flesh is like a glutton, to be honest. You've been feeding your flesh every single day. You've been sending all you want and all these different things. It's going to be very hard for you to do the things of God because you're becoming what you eat because you're constantly feeding your flesh, right? You're becoming more and more like the things that the flesh wants. Because the thing about the flesh is that if you continuously feed it, it makes it very hard for you to not gratify its desires. But instead, if you decided to start, um, feeding your spirit. You just decided to walk in the things of God, decided to pray, you know, go to your church and have some community, worship God, spend time with him, you know, deny yourself and all these things. When you begin feeding your spirit, it's going to make it a lot easier for you to not gratify the desires of the flesh, but instead to do the things of God and to walk in the spirit. And so when you begin to sin or habitually sin, it makes it very difficult for you to do the things of God, because the more that you feed your flesh, the more that it's going to want food, because it's going to become a glutton. And the more that you continue to get it, give it food, the more that you continue to gratify the desires of the flesh, the much harder it is to walk in the spirit. Because like the Bible says, it says for the desire of the flesh is against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. They are at war with each other. They are conflicted with each other. And if you decide to support the flesh over the spirit whenever they're in conflict, then it's going to make it harder for you to do the things of the spirit, which are the things of God. And it's going to affect your ability to serve God. Because when you're watching, I tr trust me, trust me, trust me. Because I know this when I, when I was teaching, when I told you I was addicted to pornography eight years, I was addicted to pornography eight years. And so I, fo I found myself oftentimes teaching people, you know, how to fight temptation, how to do all these things. But at the same time, I was going back at night, you know, uh, going, looking at my computer and watching pornography. And so it, it eventually became very difficult for me to begin to teach people and to make TikTok videos. I was constantly taking like month long breaks and stuff of that nature when I was supposed to be teaching. And that's purely because I began to feed my flesh and it made it very difficult for me to do the things that God had asked of me. And so if you find uh, if you find it hard for, you, you know, to read your Bible, to pray and to spend time with God, it might also be because you are 
feeding your flesh. But the more that you begin to feed your spirit, your spirit's not a glutton, but the more that you begin to feed your spirit, the stronger that, that your spirit becomes, the more that you're also going to want to do the things of God. Because as you begin to draw near to God, you're also going to want to do more things of God. So really, like I was saying, you are what you eat. And so when you constantly consume the things of the flesh, when you constantly consume sin, it begins to affect your ability to walk in the spirit. It begins to affect your ability to serve God. But the last thing I want to talk to you guys about is that sin also affects our ability to hear God's voice. And I want to read a verse to you here, the last verse that I have for today, probably. And it's James 4, 8. It says, come close to God and he will come close to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And if you don't know what double-minded is, I'm going to tell you what it is right now. It's when you have one foot within the things of God and one foot within the world, or more like one foot within Christ and one foot within the world. So you're half and half. Really, it's kind of, in some cases, people are double-minded and lukewarm, but not everybody that's lukewarm is double-minded, but that's something for another day, right? But I want to tell you is that whenever you sin, you begin to push yourself farther away from God. Now, God is always near, of course, but I, but really, I should say whenever you begin to sin, it begins to be very difficult for you to recognize the things of God. It becomes very difficult for you to discern the things of God, to be able to truly hear his voice and to know that he's speaking to you. And the reason for that is, is that I guess the best way to give you an example is that let's say that you have glasses like me, right? Let's say that you let's say that you have glasses you have on my plastic glasses here, right? And so you put them on. And so whenever you begin to draw close to God or come close to God, you're able to see better, right? Your glasses at first were a little bit foggy. You couldn't see a little bit. But then when you begin to draw close to God, you be you begin to be able to see better. And you're, you're able to see all the clear things around you. So then now when you're outside, you can see all the trees, you can see all the birds, you can see the little insects on the ground and all that good stuff. But then, excuse me, but then when you begin to walk in sin, your glasses start to foggy up. They start to get dirty. You know, somebody started spitting on them. Somebody put some dirt in your eyes, some mud on your glasses and so many different things. They got to be clean, but you haven't cleaned them yet because you're lazy and all these different things. And so now everything that's around you, you can't see it properly. You're out there looking at the trees and thinking that they're worms. You're out there looking at the insects and thinking that they're cars and all these different things because you can't see properly out of your glasses. And that's because when, when you sin, you begin to, in a way, push yourself away from God. You begin to push yourself away from God. And so it makes it a lot difficult for you to recognize the things of him because you're not indulging in the things of him. You do realize is that before you came to Christ, when you were a sinner, it was very hard to recognize and to see the things of God. And the reason for that is because you are constantly indulging in the things of flesh, of the flesh. But as the Bible says, when you draw near to God, he also comes closer to you. And so if he's speaking to you and you're closer to him, of course, you're going to be, be able to hear him better than if he's speaking to you and you're far away from him. Because also to give you another example, it's actually, this is a better example. To give you a, a better example, speaking to God sometimes is like being in a room that has music. And the more that you sin, the louder the music is. And, you know, if you've ever been at a party or at a rave or something like that, or even just in a place with loud music, sometimes music is so loud that you can't even hear the person next to you. You know what I'm saying? And so whenever you begin to sin, the music is louder and louder and louder and so while god's speaking to you you're only able to hear part of the message he's out here saying hey don't do that you're saying oh god you cool with that okay say less bet let's go but then he's saying the entire time like i did not want you to do anything of that nature right but the more that you begin to walk in the things of things of the spirit the more that you begin to walk in the spirit and not gratify as eyes of the flesh the more that the music begins to lower and lower and lower and then you'll be able to hear god's voice clearly and so for some of you, part of the reason why you're having such a hard time hearing God is because you might be walking in habitual sin and you're gratifying the desires of the flesh. And like I was saying earlier, you kind of become what you are, what you eat. And so when you begin to gratify the desires of the flesh, it's hard for you to walk in the spirit and to do the things of God. But it's also hard for you to be able to hear the voice of God because you're not entertaining the things of God. The best way to be able to discern or to know things are from God is if you indulge in the things of God. If you're praying and reading your Bible and worshiping and spending time and having experiences with God, whenever you see God speak to you or whenever you see God do something, you're like, oh, yeah, I know that's God because I've been spending time with him and I can recognize that it's him. 
But if you spend all your time drinking and partying and smoking and doing whatever the heck else you do and things of that nature, when God's speaking to you, giving you signs and all these different things, it's like, uh, maybe that's a coincidence because you don't recognize the things of God because you're spending too much time indulging in the things of the flesh. And so I tell you guys all these things because I want you to stop sinning, literally. <laughs> I want you to stop sinning. And for those of you that are walking in habitual sin, I want you to stop. I want you to get out of it. Don't don't be in there so long like I was, okay? Because the next generation has always got to be better. I know we're in the same generation, but I don't want y'all to go through the same things that I went through, okay? And so really, I, I really just made this series so that you guys could see like how bad sin truly is. Because sometimes as Christians, we don't know. Or in some cases, we forget. And it's something that's so incredible, incredibly detrimental to you, your relationship with God, people around you, and so many different things. Right? So I, I want you to leave at least today. <laughs> but for, for those of you who have been here through all these lessons, I want you to leave thinking like, next time that you're about to fall into t- temptation, just to think for a second, like, should I really do that? Because then if I do that, look how it's going to affect me or affect somebody around me, or affect my relationship with God? Will I be able to hear his voice better after this? Will I be able to serve him well after this? Is this what he expects of me? Does he, is this what he wants of me? I want to start placing those thoughts within your mind. That's the point of the series. And that's the point of today's message. Okay, I don't know why I keep going on, but I'm, I'm pretty much done for today. Um, does anybody have any questions? What's up, guys? I hope you're having an awesome day, and I hope that you guys enjoyed that video talking about how sin affects our relationship with God. I was very, very, very happy and excited to teach that lesson because it's something that I don't think all Christians necessarily know about, but sin is dangerous for your relationship with God. And from your relationship with God stems everything else that is going to go on with our faith as Christians, so it's good to know how sin is going to affect that so that, you know, when you're sitting there about to, you know, maybe watch some pornography or fornicate or something, you're like, man... How's that finna affect me? How's that finna affect my relationship with God? But I think that was the end of the series that I had on the reality of sin. So next, I believe in my class, I'm going to be teaching about temptation first. So for those of you that, you know, watch these videos in regards to my class and follow up with that, that's going to be the next thing that we're going to be talking about. Now, on the opposite hand, if you would like to join my class, it's every single Thursday at 9 o'clock p.m. Eastern on Google Meets. And if you just go down to the links in the description, you'll find the code to the Google Meet. And you will also find the link to the Google Meet. So at 9 o'clock p.m. Eastern or whatever time it is during that time on my time, wherever you are, you can just click on that link or you can just put in that code. You'll join the class. You'll be in and then you can be there with us and have fellowship and all that stuff. Because it's a good place to be at Q&A's and fellowship. And we get to learn about Jesus and how to live for Jesus. That's the big part about the class is me teaching new Christians and younger Christians and people that don't really know too much about our faith, about Jesus, theology and how to live for Christ. Now, another thing that y'all should do is that you should totally follow your boy on his other social media. If you're just a YouTube subscriber, then follow me on TikTok and follow me on Instagram. If you're here from TikTok and you just came to YouTube, follow me on Instagram. If you're here from Instagram to YouTube, which I'll be surprised if you were, were, then go follow me on TikTok. But go support your boy on all of his social media. And then also, if you would like to support my ministry, I have my Zelle, PayPal, and Cash App down in the links below. And also my social media is down in the links below as well. But if the spirit moves you to support me or, you, or you're just like, I like this guy's content, so I want to support him and his ministry, then go ahead and donate there below. I would really appreciate it. And I just say God bless you and thank you for such things because you provide for me. But that's all I got. You guys make sure that you have a blessed day and know that Jesus loves you. And I'll see you guys later.